Now I want to turn our attention to uh, Japan's relations with, uh, with the West, uh, that is with uh, European and uh, American powers during this time period. Uh, and in order uh, to do this, I will be presenting uh, a lot of my own research uh, on Russo-Japanese relations. Um, it's no accident that uh, I'm going to use Russo-Japanese relations to illustrate uh, how relations with Westerners overall during this time period went. Uh, because with the exception of the Dutch, no Western countries uh, did have any real sustained contact with Japan other than the Russians uh, throughout this whole period. Uh, and the way that the Russians uh, were uh, incorporated into the Tokugawa foreign relations system uh, isn't entirely obvious. On the face of it, they were just like any of the other Western powers, uh, England, Portugal, the United States. Uh, they were never permitted to establish trade with Japan, uh, even though on numer numerous occasions uh, they tried to do this and were officially rebuffed as were representatives from the United States. Uh, you, you, you've seen that the Portuguese embassy was just executed in 1640. Uh, but there were certain things that made the Russian interaction with Japan different uh, from that of the, of the other powers. Uh, it was much more sustained because basically the Russians were much closer. This is that northernmost island of Japan today, Hokkaido. Uh, and Matsumai Domain is right here. Uh, this is Sakhalin Island, uh, today controlled by Russia. Uh, some Japanese still claim half of it for reasons that have to do with the Second World War. Um, and this is the Kuril Archipelago. Then here, if you can imagine, Kamchatka. Uh, then Siberia. And here, and then if we move over to the west, there's the broad expanse of Siberia and then continental Russia. The Russians had arrived on the coast of the Sea of Ohotsk, basically a body of water right here, uh, in 1640. Then they constructed two uh, main bases in the region, one in Kamchatka over here, uh, the other in Ohotsk uh, approximately here. And uh, they then followed uh, basically sea otters, uh, across the Bering Strait into Alaska and established a colony in Alaska that was managed by a semi-private entity known as the Russian American Company um, and that was actually a kind of a colonial administration in the Americas. And the Russian American Company, and before it was even founded, people who later went on to found the Russian American Company, uh, had an interest in the Kuril Archipelago for exactly the same reason. Uh, there were sea otters here, and if you could catch them and skin them, uh, you could make a handsome profit. And so the Russians uh, came down uh, looking for the sea otters and basically subjugating uh, the uh, indigenous peoples of the region uh, and getting them to hunt these sea otters for the Russians. Um, throughout the 17th century and then into the 18th century, at the same time that uh, the uh, Matsumaya clan and the merchants that they licensed, um, these merchants came from all over Japan, uh, were uh, consolidating their hold on Ezo uh, and on the Ainu people who lived there. Now, the people who lived here in the Kareels uh, were also Ainu. They were uh, very, uh, very used to trading amongst each other they were seafaring peoples, and uh, the encroachment of these two powers, uh, the Russians and the Japanese, uh, in a way actually uh, managed to split the, uh, the Ainu world. There were also Ainu here uh, on Sakhalin, another area where uh, Japanese merchants had established a fishing post and some uh, Japanese samurai had established guard posts to guard them, uh, and where the Russians were also coming in and thinking that this was an uh, attractive area that they might want to control for themselves. But what the Russians wanted most of all was food, because Alaska and Siberia are bleak and uh, inhospitable places where the growing season is in fact uh, too short for uh, many 
European crops. And the Russians, by the 18th century, knew that there was a, a string of islands to the south of these uh, Kuril Islands, uh, known as Japan, uh, which was said to be incredibly rich, and where uh, Russian merchants believed they could obtain food, ship it through the Kurils to Siberia, and then to Alaska, and to feed uh, the Russian colonies there. And they actually sent a number of missions uh, some of which made contact with Ainu, uh, Ainu chiefs, and also with samurai from the Matsumai clan. Um, and in the uh, 1770s, uh, this trade delegation basically met uh, in Nemuro, which is a, a, a small uh, guard post here. Uh, it is now a town uh, in Hokkaido. And the Matsumai officials uh, essentially told the Russians, uh, well, look, we don't have permission from the Tokugawa to trade with you, so we can't do that. But if you want, you can keep trading with the Ainu. Uh, the Ainu can then sell you food that they bought from us, and they can kind of act as uh, these middlemen. Uh, and the uh, Matsumai merchants never explicitly stated this to the Russians. But over the course of the following years, it became clear uh, that they were ending up in possession of many Russian goods uh, that were traded in this way. And for a while, um, the Russians uh, were able to actually um, get a lot of Japanese rice in this way. Um, the, uh, the Russian operation eventually uh, expanded. They built a full-fledged trading outpost on this island, Urup, uh, in 1795, uh, which operated until 1806, when the Tokugawa shut it down, as we shall see. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but essentially, the Russians had now uh, inserted themselves into the commercial network of Ezo, this place that was uh, supposed to be dominated by uh, the Matsumaya, uh, because the Tokugawa let them control uh, trade with the Ainu. They were using this trade as a way to control the region. Uh, but now you have a new player. You have the Russians coming in, uh, and worst of all, um, the uh, Matsumaya uh, don't tell the Tokugawa about this. In fact, when uh, there are rumors about Russians trading with the Ainu in the Kurils and the Matsumaya knowing all about this, the Matsumaya lie and say, no, no, no Russians, none at all, uh, nowhere around here, uh, we don't know what you're talking about, we never talk to them, and it becomes clear that they're lying. Now, in the Tokugawa order, as we have seen, uh, there is an acceptable amount of disobedience that the Tokugawa were able to put up with from their subordinates. But this crossed the line. This crossed the line because the Matsumaya were in fact carrying out foreign relations with another power, uh, in this case Russia, uh, and in this case in the form of trade, without express permission from the Tokugawa. Uh, this became a, a serious matter. Uh, investigations were launched. Uh, in the 1780s, and matters uh, actually came to a head in the 1790s, because the Russians had not been idle. Uh, the Russian court had seen this trickle of trade going from uh, Japan through the Ainu uh, up north, and they liked this, and they wanted to expand upon it. So in 1792, uh, Catherine the Great, uh, the Tsarina of Russia, sends an official Russian government delegation to Japan to establish formal trade once and for all. This mission sails out of Europe, all, you know, all the way over to the west, uh, around Africa, uh, through the Indian Ocean, and arrives in, um, uh, I'm, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and arrives in Ezel. Um, this is a uh, unprecedented event. 
Uh, it is led by uh, Captain Adam Loxman. Uh, he's actually an army uh, officer. And uh, he presents, um, through these local uh, Tokugawa negotiators in, uh, in Ezo, who had been dispatched uh, to deal with this situation, uh, the Matsumai certainly cannot keep this under wraps, uh, so these Tokugawa representatives are presented with official letters from the Tsarina of Russia uh, saying, you know, we really like you, and by the way, won't you uh, establish trade with us? Japanese authorities are in a uh, very delicate position. Tokugawa authorities are in a very delicate position. On the one hand, uh, they realize that uh, Ru the Russians are uh, militarily much more advanced uh, by now. They see the ship that uh, the Russian delegation had arrived in. Uh, they're familiar with Western technology through the Dutch as well. Uh, and they know that the Russians can, if they really want to, uh, keep pressing the issue and um, th it may become uh, the case that the Tokugawa are pressured into accepting trade or have to fight. Either way is uh, not desirable. And the Tokugawa, um, the, the Tokugawa government during the uh, 1780s and 1790s uh, is actually debating the issue of what to do with Ezo, uh, how to deal with these Russians that they know are up there. Uh, and, you know, into this debate comes this Russian trade delegation. So uh, matters have come to a head and something has to give. The man in charge of the Tokugawa Bakfu at this moment, uh, senior counselor Matsudaira Sadanobu, uh, is not opposed in principle to establishing trade with Russia. Um, in, in fact, there is some evidence to suggest that uh, in and of itself the issue uh, was not necessarily threatening to him. What he did want is he wanted to avoid the impression of having been pressured to sign a trade delegate, uh, trade uh, agreement. So what does he do? He conveys the Russian delegation from Nemuro here, overland to uh, Matsumae town, right here, uh, the, uh, the castle town of the Matsumae domain, and uh, he has his uh, official representatives receive the Russian delegation, uh, show them respect, uh, and give them two pieces of paper. The first is a fascinating piece of paper called the Admonishment, which uh, contains a, a few uh, very key uh, provisions that we need to understand to understand the course of Japanese foreign relations uh, from this point on. Sadanobu says that Japan has an ancestral law that it cannot establish trade or diplomacy with any new partners, uh, that is, with any new lands with which their people have already uh, not been in contact. Uh, so no new diplomacy, no new trade. Uh, and uh, the Russians are to understand this and leave at once, uh, or else there, uh, there's a veiled threat that there may be some uh, dire consequences. This is not true, in fact. Um, we've seen what the maritime prohibitions were. They were a set of prohibitions against specific countries, like Portugal and Spain, or specific religious sects, uh, such as uh, Catholic Christians, uh, and <laughs> essentially all Christians, really, uh, except for the Dutch, who are kind of allowed a tenuous freedom to practice Protestantism within the boundaries of, of Dejima Castle. Uh, but what these maritime prohibitions were not is a uh, clear, well-defined law. Uh, they were not even a single law. They were sets of pronouncements, um, as I said, against specific targets. But this person, Sadanobu, is presenting the Russians with a narrative of this ancestral law truly being ancestral. In fact, it was created right when he wrote this document, essentially. Um, so here's this admonishment letter that he gives to the Russians, which says we have this ancestral law. But he also gives them a second document, 
which is a, um, a pass to enter Nagasaki in order to conclude, uh, in order to negotiate trade. So what is going on here? Why is he giving the Russians these two seemingly uh, mutually contradicting documents? Well, what he's doing is he's basically saving face. The Russians uh, are basically told to go away publicly, um, but it makes uh, this document makes an exception. Uh, uh, basically, um, it uh, it ends by saying that well, you know, if if uh, we'll take pity on you, uh, if you really need to come to Nagasaki to uh, to trade, uh, and then there is this pass which allows them to enter Nagasaki. So he talks tough, Sadanobu does. Uh, he talks tough, but he actually. Uh, is making a compromise with the Russians, um, basically telling them, okay, you can come to Nagasaki. Uh, many historians, including myself, think that if Laxman had continued to Nagasaki immediately, uh, he could have established official trade between Russia and Japan, but Laxman, this is 1793, <coughs> He decides to go back to Russia first uh, to report and then to come back later, uh, but he never ends up coming back. And that's because in 1793, all of Europe is basically uh, glued uh, to events surrounding the French Revolution. Uh, Catherine the Great is about to die. Uh, she's worried about what the French are doing, how this means the overthrow of monarchy, etc., etc. Uh, so she never follows up on this initial success. And um, the, um, the feeling in Japan was, well, um, we talked tough to these Russians and they left. Uh, you know, we had admonished these barbarians uh, and the Tokugawa now found themselves uh, in the position of uh, having this document on the books, this admonishment, which says we have this ancestral law, uh, you told the Russians we have this law, the Russians had obeyed, therefore this law, even though it was not ancestral, kind of took on a life of its own, because the Russians had performed obedience by leaving, and never mind this pass that they had to enter Nagasaki. The Russians, however, did not forget about this pass. In 1804, they set out another expedition, uh, official expedition, that left from uh, European Russia, uh, sailed halfway around the world, and ended up in Japan uh, in 1804, um, basically almost 10 years after Luxman had left. And the person in charge of the Russian embassy, uh, a courtier by the name of Nikolai Rizanov, a close confidant of Tsar Alexander II, uh, I'm sorry, Alexander I, um, Rizanov uh, found a very, very different reception. Uh, he had uh, arrived in Nagasaki carrying this pass, which says that, you know, uh, a Russian ship can go and uh, negotiate for trade in Nagasaki. It's a self -con uh, safe conduct pass. And he shows up in Nagasaki and nobody's very much interested in talking to him. In fact, uh, many of the samurai officials who receive him are openly rude to him, saying, well, we told you to go away. Why are you back? You left the first time. Good. Uh, stay gone. Rizanov says, no, no, no. I have this pass and, uh, you know, it allows me to come in here. But it's been 10 years and this ancestral law doctrine uh, has, th this rhetoric has been accepted as official law uh, and the samurai are saying uh, we don't want to hear anything about it we know you have this pass we're not going to shoot at you but you have to leave and um, you, we're not giving you trade or, or anything like that Rizanov is uh, very very upset in the meantime uh, significant changes had taken place in Ezo uh, the Matsumae had been kicked out of Ezo uh, their right to manage uh, the trade with the Ainu had been revoked by the Tokugawa uh, because of their initial um, lack of... Uh, they broke faith with the Tokugawa by not reporting uh, that trade, uh, that Russian Ainu trade that they were themselves indeed profiting from. And so uh, the Tokugawa 
uh, in two stages, uh, in 1799 and in 1802, uh, basically took Ezo away from the Matsumaya, took their domain away, uh, kicked Matsumaya down to a minor uh, fief in Honshu, and took over the management of the domain themselves, and essentially took over the management of all of Ezo upon themselves, the Tokugawa did. They sent up troops to garrison it. Uh, they tried to reverse some of the abuses uh, that the Ainu were suffering at the hands of uh, greedy merchants, greedy Japanese uh, Matsumaya licensed merchants up there, uh, and essentially became a lot more directly involved with the administration of this entire region while still claiming that Ezo was not a part of Japan. Uh, so essentially, uh, the Tokugawa had taken over the role of these colonial administrators away from their subordinates and uh, taken it on to themselves. Uh, and this trade with the Russians was seen as a security risk, and the Tokugawa were in no mood to expand it, to make it official. In fact, in 1806, uh, they passed a uh, decree forbidding Ainu uh, from trading with the Russians and this colony on Urup that had funneled uh, Japanese rice to America and to Siberia uh, collapsed essentially. Um, it, it disappears from the record. Um, the, uh, the last factor uh, living there is dead, um, dies of natural causes but in complete isolation. For a while it's not even very clear what happened to this colony. Uh, and so the Russians are frustrated. Uh, Rezanov had been rebuffed by 1805, and he goes up, Nagasaki's in Kyushu in western Japan, he goes up the Japanese coast and then goes into the waters around Ezo and kind of scouts out uh, the area, uh, makes a note of the Japanese presence there, and decides that what he will do is he will force Japan to trade with Russia. So in 1806, he orders two of his subordinates, uh, Khvastov and Davidov, both naval officers, but both at the time serving with the Russian-American company, uh, he orders them to take two ships and go raid a bunch of places in Ezo. Um, between 1806 and 1807, Khvastov and Davidov do this. Um, then <coughs> Rizanov, uh, who uh, hopes to get the Japanese to... Uh, basically uh, to, to frighten the Tokugawa into trading, uh, sends a few threatening messages, but then uh, something happens which we can't explain. Perhaps he thinks he's made a mistake, um, and he writes a bunch of letters to the Russian government blaming the raids on uh, Khvastov and Davidov themselves, saying, I never ordered these raids, uh, and uh, takes off to go to Russia to explain himself. But in 1809, while crossing Siberia, he dies. Oddly enough, in that same year, Khvastov and Davidov, who had been imprisoned as a result of uh, Rizanov's accusations, uh, they also die. Uh, they fall through the ice uh, on a frozen river uh, in St. Petersburg, and uh, they're, they're killed. So all of the people involved in uh, launching these raids, uh, all of the Russians uh, are dead. And the Tokugawa are really, really scared. The raids of 1806 and 1807 were by far the most significant military defeats that Japan had suffered at the hands of foreigners since the Korean invasions. Um, the Edo period, as I mentioned, was a, a, a time of peace, uh, and overall this is absolutely true, but these raids represent one exceptional uh, time uh, during this period, exceptional uh, event, where uh, there was actual violence, and it was very, very, very embarrassing for the Tokugawa. Because the Japanese troops, the samurai troops, that they had deployed in places like Etorofu, Kunashiri, uh, Rishiri Island here, Kushinkotan here in, um, uh, in Sakhalin, uh, and in uh, some places around uh, Hokkaido, around Ezo Island, uh, these had suffered humiliating defeats. 
there was an instance where uh, the ships of Hlostov and Davidov surprised uh, a Tokugawa garrison uh, fortified uh, uh, in a very strong position here on Etorofu Island, uh, took over the castle, just chased all of the samurai away. It was a complete disaster. Uh, the leader of the samurai garrison uh, committed suicide because he was so ashamed of how he'd performed. Um, and then the Russians got drunk and uh, partied in the abandoned castle for a night, and then they left, um, uh, burning everything they couldn't take with them. Oddly enough, the Russians were so drunk uh, that they left two men ashore uh, who had just been passed out, and nobody had noticed that they were gone. Uh, these were swiftly killed. Uh, but overall, uh, despite the, the death of these two Russians, this was seen as a complete humiliation and a challenge to this system of the ancestral law that the Tokugawa had now invoked against the Russians. Uh, and now, if they couldn't enforce this system of ancestral law, if they couldn't have the Russians go away, um, then they could be in real trouble when uh, their vassals started asking, well, if these Tokugawa can't control these rowdy foreigners, what good are they for anyway? Uh, there was a lot of anxiety around what had happened in 1806 and 1807.